Hi, I'm Jim White from the Southwest Church of Christ. Welcome to our weekly class. I hope that you're prepared uh, to study uh, one of the Beatitudes today. Uh, we have uh, been involved in, in looking at, uh, at the Beatitudes in depth. And, and I would encourage you, don't just listen to me, but get you some books, get some commentaries, read up on these, come up with some of your own opinions on this. Uh, I, I wish I had a, a lock on all knowledge, but I don't. Uh, and so I would encourage you uh, to, to do your own study and to find out uh, what God wants you to do, what Jesus is calling you to do. Uh, I know uh, Randy Harris has, uh, uh, I don't know if he still does this, but he used to do this. Uh, he would have a group of students that would come to his house and the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, would be what he would encourage them to do. And he'd say, go, go live it. And uh, so uh, these, are, these are wonderful principles to live by. We've already talked about two of them. Uh, we talked about being poor in spirit. And, and really, uh, the poor, that, that uh, the word that uh, Jesus uses there is destitute. To, to understand our spiritual condition. Uh, and then he says, blessed are those who mourn. And, um, and I've, I've kind of come around to this, but I used to think that it was only those who, who mourn their own sin. Uh, but I, I've started to, to see a little differently in that not only is it that, but it's the ability or the 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 capability or maybe the, uh, the desire uh, to mourn for the world, to mourn for that which is around us uh, because we see the condition uh, that, is, that is happening all around us. Um, he says if, you're, if you mourn, he'll comfort you. So we come to chapter uh, 5, verse 5, and he, he and it's interesting, if you look at these Beatitudes, they seem to, to just fit together. They just, one right after another, just seems to, to just blend in. It's almost as if uh, there's one, uh, one topic throughout the whole thing. Not that there's not other topics, but this whole concept of the whole person, the way that we should be as Christians. And, and, and so he's got this one, and, and blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. William Barclay, and I, you know, I read his uh, translation, I guess, every week. And I'm not sure I agree with this, but I, I'll give it to you anyway. Oh, the bliss of the man who is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time who has every instinct and impulse and passion under control because he himself is God controlled who has the humility to realize his own ignorance and his own weakness for such a man is a king among men. Well, who is a meek person? If you were to define meekness how would you define it? More than likely, what you would say is it's the guy who kind of sits over in the corner and you say, boo, and he kind of jumps. And you say, look at this guy, he's kind of meek. But really, the, the term and the definition of meekness has changed over the years. You know, it's kind of like, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll use this, uh, the term gay. Uh, I remember I was in a play in high school called Our Hearts Were Young and Gay, and it used to mean uh, happy. And now gay means someone who um, is, is homosexual. And so, uh, you know, we've got this uh, meek description in our mind that's changed over the years, and so it's hard for us to, to shed that, that concept of meekness. Listen to this passage from Matthew chapter 11, 
starting in verse 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, or burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The King James Version uses the term meek, for I am meek and lowly. In almost every case where the King James Version translates meek, all the other translations, or most of the other translations, translate it as gentle. Now in this passage, it's talking about Jesus, of course. And, and in the Beatitudes, um, they are two different words in the Greek language. Uh, one of them is praots. I'm probably saying that wrong. That's what it is, what meek is in the Beatitudes. Maybe I should say praunts. Praus. Praus, there you go. It means mild and humble and meek. In Matthew 11, where it says, for I am meek and humble in heart, it's praus. So they sound very similar, and they come from a very uh, similar word. The meaning for meek, like I said, is changed. Praus is a word for an animal that's been domesticated, that's been brought under control, that's been tamed. In fact, one of the commentators that I read talked about a horse. You know, you've seen the rodeos on TV and, or, the, or the westerns on TV where they, they bring in a horse and they need to break the horse and the horse is bucking and all that kind of stuff. And the cowboy comes up and he's got a rope and he's easy boy and he puts the rope around him and the horse is fine. And then he jumps on the back and it bucks and bucks and bucks until finally he breaks the horse and he's able to ride the horse and the horse becomes uh, his mate. That's the image that's, that's sometimes used to describe bringing this wildness under control. But once again, and, and we started with this, we have the humility trait. Humility. Well, who are the meek? Well, I'm glad you asked. They are the ones who are submissive to God's will. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? It was before his crucifixion. He was praying the sweat drops of blood. I was reading from Luke today uh, the description of that. Uh, he was about to die. He was about to be crucified, the most gruesome kind of death there is. And he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. In essence, he said, if there's any other way. But you notice what he said right after that? But not my will, but yours be done. In the model prayer, uh, and, and I, I'm fascinated by this. Um, I, I, we, we call it the Lord's Prayer. I call it the model prayer. Uh, really, the Lord's Prayer is over in John chapter 17. But, but in, the, in the model prayer, in the Lord's Prayer, uh, it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, that's meekness. I, I, I have people ask me every once in a while, especially when we talk about God's will, and, and we talk about, um, and, and the question is often asked, what is God's will for my life? And Blackaby, who wrote uh, a book called Experiencing God, says that's the wrong question to ask. We shouldn't be asking, what is God's will for me? We should be asking, what is God's will? And then moving into that. Being happy, contented spirit, meek. Those who do not quarrel with God. 
You ever quarrel with God? You ever say, why me? What are you doing this for? Instead of saying to God, what can I learn from this? There's a big difference there in submission, isn't there? But number two, being willing to be flexible to God's word. Psalm 119 and 18 says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things at all times. I, I thought of this song. We sing it here every once in a while. And, and I, couldn't, I couldn't come up with all the words. And, and so I, I ran into Caleb's office and said, What are the words to? And he found them for me. But listen to what he says. Or listen to what the words are. Open my heart to what you know so I can stretch, so I can grow. My feelings toss me to and fro. Open my heart to what you know. Open my eyes to what you see to understand what I should be. My feelings get the best of me. Open my eyes to what I see. Open my ears to what you hear so I can keep you very near. My feelings make it so unclear. Open my ears to what you hear. Open my heart to what you know so I can stretch, so I can grow. My feelings toss me to and fro. Open my heart to what you know. That's really the definition of meekness, isn't it? To open our hearts to allow God to come in and, and take over and let him to, to, to reign in our hearts and, and for us to be submissive to him and, and be, be flexible and bendable. And when God's word is contrary to what we are, to be able to allow God's word to bend us. But a meek person is also one who is humble. One doesn't, uh, one who doesn't put him or herself superior to others. It's the opposite of a proud person. One of the things that I thought of immediately uh, was Jesus washing feet. Jesus, of all people, um, could have had his feet washed a million times. And yet, and yet he got down on his hands and knees and washed the feet of his disciples. I remember reading a story. I wish I'd looked it up, but I just thought of it. It's in one of William Bennett's books. Um, I forget the name of it. It's not the moral compass. But anyway, um, he tells a story of a king. And, and everybody is just fawning all over this king. And, and you know, he, he says, so I can do anything I want. The old king, whatever you say, you can do. He said, really? You, everything I say, you can, that it'll come about. And they said, king, you are so great, so mighty. You are, you are it. He said, okay, Really? He said, take my throne and put it down by the ocean. And so, okay, we'll do that. And so they took it down. And as he sat there, the waves came in. And he said, waves go out. And they didn't listen. They kept lapping up until his robe was wet. And he told them, he said, there is only one king. And I'm not him. And the story says that from that day on, legend has it that he took his crown off and never wore it again. Because when we acknowledge who the real king is, we will understand what humility is. We don't have to have the spotlight. We don't have to have the best chair. I, uh, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. I used to have some dealings with uh, a, guy named, a guy named Paul Carter. 
Paul was chief financial officer for Walmart, and uh, he had given us a lot of money uh, to recruit students, and so um, I was in charge of that, and so I, I had some, um, some communication with him. He was really Sam Walton's right-hand man. And Paul told me this story. He said, he said, we had a company picnic, and he said the company picnic was always at Sam's house. And he said, we were cleaning up, and he said, you know, there's a, there's a whole mess to pick up, and, and uh, you know, he said, we, we got to pick up the coolers and all the leftover food and all that kind of stuff, and he said he was getting ready to pick up a cooler and put it on the back of a pickup, and he said he heard this voice say, Paul, if you just pick that up, we'll throw it up here on the, on the back of the pickup. And he said he looked at the other end, it was Sam Walton. And he said, I thought, here is the richest man in America at that time. And he says, and yet he is involved in cleaning up. When he could pay for anybody to do it, he helped clean up. But a meek person is also a gentle person. Doesn't speak harshly. Not domineering. And we keep looking to Jesus, and rightly so. If you'll turn to Philippians chapter 2, there's a very, very familiar passage there that I want to read. Starting in chapter 2, Eh, let's start in verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather in humility, there's that word again, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, I want you to, Man, to pay close attention to this. This is so important. I want you to really think through the position that Jesus had and what he did. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. And rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's a gentle person. A, a, a meek person is a patient person. Uh, I, I don't know what to say about this. Uh, one who puts up with a lot. One who is long-suffering. I think that's a little different than, uh, than patient, but it's pretty close. In fact, I, I heard all my life that, that Job was a man of patience, but really Job was a man of long-suffering. Patience is being able to, to maintain your coolness in your calmness when all else around you is seemingly falling apart. But a meek person is also one who forgives. We tend to be revengeful, or at least we, we have a, a saying that says, uh, I don't get mad, I get even, instead of forgiving. Martha and I have some dear friends um, we we kind of grew up together, not only as parents. Uh, we first met them when they had first been married for a couple of weeks. 
they had two boys, two sons. And uh, they were about the same age as our kids. And um, it was kind of interesting. Years later, I mean years later, uh, the oldest boy was telling his mother, you know, when I got in trouble, when you fussed at me, I would go into your bathroom and get your toothbrush and swish it in the toilet. Well, that's not very forgiving, is it? <laughs> of course, you're probably saying right now, ew, you know, that's exactly our response too. But some people want to get revenge and some people want to give even rather than, than forgiving. You remember Peter came to Jesus and he said, how many times should we forgive? Seven times? He, you see, the Jewish law said basically all you had to do is three times. And Peter says, well, let's double that and add one for good measure. Seven is a perfect number. Therefore, he thought he was going to really impress Jesus. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You forgive 70 times seven. Now, that doesn't mean, okay, 490 times. And then 491, boop, that's it. Jesus is saying, no, you forgive and you forgive and you forgive. But a meek person is also content. We use the passage from Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13 that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But if you read that passage and read what's before that, Paul says, I've learned what it's like to have good things and I've learned what it's like to have bad things. I've learned what it's like uh, to have a lot. I've learned what it's like not to have much. And he says, I have learned to be content in any and every situation. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's not talking about accomplishing things. He's talking about contentment. And that's what a meek person is. Job had his faults. But in the end, he knew who his God was. So a meek person is submissive, a meek person is flexible to God's word, a meek person is humble, a meek person is gentle, a meek person is patient, a meek person is forgiving, and a meek person is content. Now I want to return to, to Barclay's comment about angry at the right time. I'm sure what William Barclay is referring to is when Jesus uh, cleared the temple. I'm sure what he's referring to is when Jesus goes and he sees Mary and Martha and they're weeping over Lazarus and he's deeply moved, uh, more, more or less angry. And so I'm not sure I completely agree with this, but at least we have to, you know, at least we have to look at it. But the interesting thing to me is at the end of all this, he says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. What in the world does he mean by that? Inherit the earth. Well, uh, there is some thought that what he means is that one day God will restore everything to the way it used to be. It'll be very much like Eden was, that uh, Everything will be perfect, and, and he's going to recreate the earth. Uh, there's talk of the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and so, you know, they'll inherit the earth. There's one religious group that says there's 144,000, and the rest of them will be here on earth. Kind of interesting. But in essence, I think what he's saying is a meek person will enjoy and be content with what he has here on earth. I think it also means that you're glad that others have what they have. That's part of contentment, isn't it? And I think meekness and inheriting the earth refers to enjoying the best of life that is given to us. I refer to this a lot, but John chapter 10, verse 10, 
Jesus says, I came or I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. Perhaps that's what he's saying here in this beatitude. It's blessed are the meek for they will have the best of what this earth offers. Now, we're not talking about the health and wealth gospel that, that you'll be wealthy and those kind of things. I think that's a false gospel. But we can be happy in times when we don't have much. I've, I've talked about this a lot. Martha and I didn't have very much when we first got married. But we were happy. We enjoyed each other's company. Uh, we loved our life. We loved our friends. We loved our church. You don't have to have a lot of things in order to inherit the earth. And so we come to the end of this beatitude and, and we have this stair step. Blessed are the poor in spirit when we realize who we are. Blessed are those who mourn for they'll be comforted. We understand who we are and we weep over who we are. And then he starts to bring it home. Blessed are the meek. Then he starts saying, all right, I need you to be submissive. I need you to understand what I want you to do. And I want you to follow me. It's a great lesson that Jesus brings not only to the people of his day, but also to us. I hope you have a good day. Stay out of the cold, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening.